On January 6, 2021, a mob broke into the Capitol building of the United States in Washington, D.C. following months of disinformation and conspiracy theories about the 2020 presidential election, including the QAnon conspiracy movement. One man, Jacob Chansley, stood out due to his seemingly outlandish garb. Media outlets plastered his face and self-given title, Q Shaman, all over, but seemed to describe him in much the same way. So you're gonna wait until he shows up in the fur Viking hat? The guy in the Viking hat? There was a man dressed up as a Viking in the Capitol building? <sighs> Guess what? It's not a Viking hat. And no, not just because the Vikings didn't wear horned helmets. We'll get there. But it is interesting that it was identified as such. I'm going to show you the far grimmer truth of what it actually is, why he wore it, and why media outlets were so eager to accept that framing. By focusing on Jacob Chansley, I don't mean to suggest that his own particular brand is the only one seen on January 6th. There were Templar, Spartan, and Holocaust imageries in abundance at the riot. Nor do I mean to suggest that medieval studies ought to be the center of attention when thinking about the imagery in the riot. It shouldn't be. However, the media has already centered the Viking and medieval world. Listen to one of the capital police who fought there. Looks like a medieval battle scene. You know, some of the most brutal combat you know, I've ever, uh, ever encountered. He is wrong. The riots had very few similarities to a medieval battle, and that error has consequences. So, it's important that we talk about it, and reject the framing of white supremacists and the way they imagine the past to be. While the hat is not a Viking hat, that doesn't mean it's some fantasy nonsense either. This is a real piece of clothing used by a real culture. Or, more accurately, it's two real pieces of clothing tacked together. Chansley's hat is an Ochedi Sakowing Peteje Wabhaha with coonskin tails stuck on. The buffalo horn headdress is part of the ceremonial regalia of the Ochedi Sakowing, or Sioux, peoples. Like the better known feather headdresses, it is a mark of honor and bravery given to a warrior of the tribe. The giving of the headdress is a mark of high honor, given that it is constructed out of the horns and hide of the most sacred animal of the Ochedi Sakowing, and is decorated with owl feathers. It can only be worn by the recipient in a few contexts, either in the powwow or in ceremonies relating to bison hunts. However, Chansley's hat is altered in a significant way. It has two raccoon tails hanging off the sides, a clear reference to coonskin caps. These caps are iconic elements of American settler colonialism, personified in men like Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone. They, in part thanks to 20th century film, are the ultimate examples of rugged American individualism. The relationship between frontiersmen and native peoples are complicated. Boone had a close relationship with tribes across the Appalachians, and Crockett was a staunch advocate for the rights of native peoples in opposition to President Andrew Jackson's constant genocides. However, they and other frontiersmen were also in a fundamentally antagonistic relationship with native peoples, and they fought regularly. Under influence from Westerns, this warfare between settler and native peoples is emphasized, neatly summed up in this French image from La Ballade de Davy Crockett. Altering a bison headdress with coonskin tails is not subtle imagery, it is the tacking on of white colonial symbols onto native cultures. The former assaults the latter, in echo of centuries of harm, stolen land, broken treaties, and slaughtered families, that has characterized the United States' interactions with native nations since its founding and continuing until today. South Dakota, in February 2021, denied funding for a Lakota immersion program at a school, continuing that assault into the very present. But I bet if you ask Chansley about it, he'd deny that he actually constructed this intentionally. The garb instead seems to represent a form of exoticism, where an individual mimics the styles and cultures of a foreign culture, especially one that they find inferior to their own. The appropriate culture is falsely perceived of as primitive, savage, immoral, etc., but is simultaneously alluring and compelling in some way still. In Europe, the most common target was the Ottoman Empire or European colonies, and in the United States, it's been native peoples. As such, using a buffalo or horn headdress is primarily for the effect of it, and how it fits this weird primitivism associated with shamans. Stay tuned for a video on that later this summer. Unfortunately, it did that job perfectly. So, if Jacob Chansley's hat is North American, not Viking, why did media call it that? 
Well, it does fit into an aesthetic that's known as folkish. The present iteration of that style has beards, braided hair, tattoos, usually with Norse designs, etc. However, it's a lot older. Some variation goes all the way back to the 19th century with pan-Germanic, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic occultism. This isn't a place for a full history of the folkish. The aesthetics of folkish movements were adapted far beyond the ideological backing, but check the description for readings on that, or join the community Discord server and I'll be happy to rant about it more there. For our purposes, it's enough to know that the folkish aesthetic is a cobbled together mess of symbols from across centuries. There's pre-Viking runes, genuinely Viking Age symbols like the Valknut or Mjölnir, there's early modern Galdrastavir like the Vegvisir, there's 19th century ideas like the Tree of Life or Horned Helmets, thanks Wagner, you suck, and then you slap a fur pelt and 90s Europunk hairstyles on top of the whole thing. Various combinations of these symbols were used by the Theosophists, the Nazis, black metal bands, and are still used by the Ausa True movement. So, the folkish aesthetic isn't a clear-cut marker of someone being a bad person, to be clear. However, it is a big umbrella within which it is easy to fit a ceremonial headdress from a totally unrelated culture because it happens to be fuzzy and have horns. Yay. And while the folkish aesthetic is not inherently a bad thing, it definitely is in this context. Given how easily late night television adopted the term Viking hat, it seems like they attempted to mock Chansley by calling him a Viking. To them, it is a bad thing. This is unsurprising. The Dark Ages stereotype is alive and well. The Middle Ages are perceived of as chaotic, filthy, superstitious, and irrational, something that was left behind in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. The Vikings are that tenfold, barbarians who rampaged across Europe, leaving slaughter in their wake. Calling Chansley a Viking, then, is essentially accusing him of being a barbarian whose society moved past long ago. However, within the worldview of white supremacists, the label of being a Viking has a totally different set of connotations. To them, Vikings are manly, heteronormative, courageous, typically white, and powerful. Good things that are being threatened by inclusivity. Even when that becomes actively toxic and self-destructive, groups like Norsk praise that as being good. Read this. I think I need to bleach my everything after reading that. Ugh. Neither of these stereotypes, of course, actually reflect the historical realities and complexities of the medieval and Viking worlds. They had vibrant, diverse cultures far beyond their rating. However, the historical reality doesn't matter. The people get flattened into stereotypes leveraged for various ideologies. Of course, not all flattenings are created equal. Nazism is, in fact, very bad but they are still flattenings and still have consequences. Using the language and identifications that white supremacists want and think are good isn't a good way of denigrating them. Instead, it reinforces that yes, this is the best way to construct the image that they want. Instead of mocking it and driving them out, it bolsters their in-group and strengthens their self-identification. It can also become a tool of recruitment, given the general cultural popularity of the Vikings today. Historical stereotypes have consequences, and trying to use them to describe white supremacists accepts the white supremacist framing of the past as fundamentally correct. Their lie becomes seen as the truth. I want to reiterate, though, the biggest consequence of how the media described Jacob Chansley is the continued erasure of native peoples. The dominant media narrative didn't include their culture at all. This was something done by, for, and about white people. That is, frankly, appalling. The Ocheti Sakawang and other native tribes face ongoing persecution, and ignoring appropriations of their culture to instead assign it a European origin is accelerating that harm in quiet ways. If we want to end 400 years of cultural genocide, it needs to happen in the ways we think about them, act towards them, and even what language we use to describe the theft and alteration of their culture. Therefore, to tell the simplest truth, Jacob Chansley used a Bateha Wabhaha for the sake of white supremacist occultism, and far too much of the media didn't mention that. Thanks to the Acta Lakota Museum for the help with the Lakota terms in this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and head on over to Twitch where I stream historical games twice per week. Next month's video essay will be on video games, I promise. It's time to ask why snowy environments and Vikings are so closely tied together.